technology is working and we're ready to go. And we're delighted to have uh, Eva Miranda today um, from the, the Polytechnic University of Catalonia. Uh, I wouldn't be able to speak, pronounce it in Spanish, but um, who will give us a talk, a somewhat unusual talk, um, combination of fluid dynamics, PDs and contact geometry um, with the title Towards a Fluid Computer. Thank you, Eva. Thanks a lot for having me here. It's a pleasure to be here. I want to give a general talk. I will hide a little bit the, the like technical details. I just want to convey some ideas. I want to explain two things. One is a construction I did a long time ago with my former student, Robert Cardona, Daniel Peralta Salas, and Fran Presas, which is a construction of a, of a 3D uh, fluid computer. And then I want to go towards the end of my talk one step farther and combine this uh, fluid computer with the techniques from Feynman uh, to create what I call a hybrid computer, which is quicker than a quantum computer. But I leave this towards the end. I think I won't have a lot of time. So I'm going to start with a tale, this, this talk with a tale. I'm going to talk about rubber ducks. And I have a collection of rubber ducks at home. Isaac here gave me a very nice rubber duck that I was supposed to take to this talk. But because I will prove that it's undecidable, that there are undecidable fluid paths, in particular, the duck was never inside the, <laughs> I'm sorry. So I'm going to, to use uh, the rubber ducks uh, trip as an excuse, uh, as a metaphor for what I want to explain today, which is as a consequence of this association of a Turing machine to the movement of the fluids, we will prove that there exist fluid paths which are undecidable because the association with the Turing machine allow, allows us to use the undecidable character of the holding problem. So as a metaphor, I'm going to explain what happened in 92. In 92, there was a cargo uh, with a lot of rubber ducks and other kind of objects, but the rubber ducks are very sweet, so it's good for talks. Around 29,000 rubber ducks were lost in a storm when the cargo was making the travel from Hong Kong to Tacoma. And uh, these rubber ducks started to follow uh, very unusual uh, paths. In particular, uh, in November, 10 rubber ducks appeared in Sitka in Alaska. And in the UK, many of them were, uh, I mean, the Queen and everyone in the UK were waiting for lots of them to ar arrive in the British shores. But to the surprise, this was announced on the, I don't know if it's the Guardian or what, but I do it there, this is from 2007. And they were waiting for all these ducks. There is even a nut talking about this story that wants to sell you a, a car. And just one of them appeared. And where did this rubber duck appear? In Scotland, of course. So a little bit that's a metaphor of how these ducks appear in unexpected uh, places and what can we say about it. There is a long story also about these rubber ducks. In particular, they were really used to improve uh, a simulator, which, is called, which was called Obscures and was used by an oceanographer, Jimmy Graham, and Evans Mayer, who was really not a scientist, but uh, uh, he was interested. I mean, he was using science as a hobby, and he was following the paths of the of the rabbit ducks, and he became famous with that. And he, they, they they had been used the uh, Nike uh, some Nike uh, shoes lost, etc., to improve the the simulator of finding flock sound. In particular, they did an interesting experiment. They were throwing a lot of. Uh, messages inside a bottle. We've all seen these horrible movies where you send a lot of message inside a bottle. And of course, in the movies, the, 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 this message is received. Do you know how many of these messages are received? Only 2%, so please don't do this. Never send a lot of message in a bottle. Uh, and two of them were received, and only one of them, 1% one, 1 was uh, accepted, of course. The rest was rejections. So. How did they know that only 2% of the messages can be recovered? They know about this because 
they had been doing an experiment of putting indeed uh, a letter saying that that letter was worth 50 pounds, well, $50, this was done in the, here in the US. So of course, uh, it's quite accurate. So uh, this is a metaphor of uh, an unexpected uh, behavior of fluids, but in nature, fluids indeed often rebel against what is expected. We've seen it in the volcanoes recently. We've seen it in the tsunamis, et cetera. So it's a reasonable question to ask if fluids are complicated enough to perform computations. And indeed, this is an actual question which was asked uh, in 1999 by Chris Moore. Here we have a picture of uh, Sir Roger Penrose because Penrose was also asking where were the limits of computation are, can physical systems compute or they cannot? And there is a picture of Terry Tao because he also asked these questions uh, connected to the problem of finding a counterexample to the navier stokes conjecture. And we'll get back to that uh, in some slides. So the question is, can fluid simulate any, any computer, in particular, any Turing machine? Indeed, this could be a question uh, of a movie, right? Uh, what is the difference between reality and science fiction? Indeed, there is a book by Stanislav Lem called Solaris. You've seen the film. There are three films. Indeed, there are before the, the one by Soderbergh, there are films which are uh, done in the Soviet Union, so not so very well known. But in that uh, novel, the main uh, question is, can the, can the sea think? I mean, it's a little bit strange if you look at the, at the novel. Well, if you look precisely at the film, it's a little bit strange, but the novel is a bit better. And uh, it says, for some time, there was a held notion to the effect that the thinking ocean of Solaris was a gigantic brain, well-developed and several million years in advance of our own civilization, a sort of cosmic yomi, a sage, a symbol of omniscience, blah, blah. OK, so it's a little bit what we are trying to do is some science fiction uh, dream of Stanislav Lem. So we should ask the experts. And nowadays, you can put in the same room Alan Turing and Sir Roger Penrose, because you can do this with Midjourney, and ask them. OK, so Alan Turing uh, said, machines take me by surprise with great frequency. And of course, Sir Roger Penrose says there are completely deterministic universe models that are impossible to simulate computationally. So let's see uh, who is right. First, let's recall uh, this result by Turing. He did this in the, in the in PhD thesis. So for PhD students, this is quite, for students in general, this is quite surprising. Uh, there was an open problem, which was the holding problem, the problem of determining from a description of a computer program, whether uh, the program will finish uh, running, so the holding state, state, or will continue to run forever. And this was an open question in logics. And Turing proved that the holding problem is undecidable because he, the proof is very simple. He assumed that you can have such a supercomputer and then you can twist it to find a counterexample. So he proved that you cannot have a general algorithm to solve the, the holding problem for all possible uh, program input pairs. Uh, and so the holding problem is an unsightable problem. So now I want to relate this un unsightable problem with the uh, with the ducks, with the rubber ducks. Okay. So what's what's the relation? What does Turing have to do with the rubber ducks? The method of scores used by Graham and Ernest Mayer could not localize all the lost rubber ducks. Remember, only two percent of the love messages that you send are recovered. And what if finding the rubber ducks is also an undecidable problem? In other words, can we associate a Turing machine to the movement of the rubber ducks? And maybe the movement of the rubber ducks is too much, but to a particular fluid. So that's what we are going to do. But before I want to talk about chaos, first the standard chaos we talk about, which is the one uh, which was coined by Lawrence, chaos in this sentence, when the present determines the future, but the approximate present does not approximately determine the future. So a presentation by Robert Grice. Thanks, Robert, for these nice presentations. Uh, where we see uh, an example of the butterfly effect, we, we take some initial conditions which are very close, and we let the system evolve. And after a while, 
these walls are uh, apart. Uh, they are very apart one from each other. So that's that's the standard notion of chaos, and that's mesmerizing. That's good. It's kind of stuff at a certain point. And now I want to introduce another sort of chaos, which is the logical chaos. Okay. Well, as you know, the the Lawrence. Indeed, Lawrence, uh, in his team, he had, I want to say, Ellen Fetter and Margaret Hamilton. This is not very well known. They were the ones who were behind the, the computations that allowed to prove uh, chaos. I wanted to say this. So I want to show a dynamical system that we all know, which the Cantor set. We just take the, an interval, we divide by three, and we drop the middle part. Another nice presentation by Robert Greist. And indeed, what I want to do is associate, this is this looks like a dynamical system, and I want to associate a dynamical system to this uh, counter set, and I also want to associate a computer. Indeed, this is the idea of, of Moore. Uh, Moore, indeed, also what he was doing the PhD thesis, all these people doing the PhD thesis with these bright ideas, uh, he discovered what, okay, in the news was known it's a new form of chaos. Can you believe you are doing your PhD and you see in the news that somebody says, mathematician discovers a more complex form of chaos? It's uh, very interesting, right? Imagine it's like I wait uh, that you do this kind of discoveries when you do the thesis. So what he did was the following, the following idea. Here we have some square, okay? And he was ordering, he was doing a puzzle of squares, but this square is indeed the square counter set, okay? And what he proved is that if you have a mapping between two square counter sets, you can associate a dynamical system to it, okay? And he did it uh, using what is called generalized ships, which is a generalization of the classical notion of ships, okay? And uh, indeed, this, this is key. I'm, I'm going to show in a, in a minute how you do this, this kind of association between Turing machine and dynamical system. Uh, and mapping between the, the square counter set. But first I want to recall what is a Turing machine. I want to think of a Turing machine as a printer, a big printer of states on a very long tape. We all imagine a Turing machine like a very long tape. We can assume that it has an alphabet. We can assume that it's zeros and one. And if you want a formal definition, that's the formal definition, okay? We have collection of states. Among the states, there are two very important states. The, the first state, the initial state, and the holding state, okay? We have sigma and alphabet, and we have delta, which is the transition function. The transition function tells me, and it is the user's guide of this printer. It tells me how to print, okay? It tells me, well, if you are in the holding state, then you just stop. Otherwise, you compute following these rules, and this epsilon, is plus one or minus one, and it tells you it tells you if you go to the left or to the right. Let me show an example. Well, the, here we have the the example. If we have delta q zero uh, associated to q prime one plus one, we are replacing zero by one, and because there is this plus one, the printer is going to move to the right, but the the tape will move to the left. This is the, mass one, the plus one condition. And that's a way to think about Turing machines. It's not the only way. We could also think uh, Turing machines as, uh, as an automaton. Indeed, for instance, we have Con Conway's Game of Life, and we can think of this preferred camera is disconnected. What's going on? <laughs> it's back. Oh, okay. It's back. Okay, good. Uh, so, uh, we can take Conway's game, which is this one. I mean, we have, it's a boring game because it's not even a solo game. You don't play, I mean, it plays on his own. You have some conditions and then you have, you can play this everywhere, for instance, on a torus. And then you see the evolution of these cells according to the rules of survival and death. And come on, okay, there we go. You can play this game and this is equivalent to to a tape uh, in the Turing machine moving. This was proved by von Neumann. And okay, now I want to, in this slide, I want to convey, to, to convince you that it's the same to have a Turing machine than to have a mapping uh, between two square counters. 
So here I take just a picture of a Turing machine printing in a certain moment. I have a collection of zero and ones, which I collect on the left uh, in green and on the right in red, okay? And I look at these numbers as the coefficients of the ternary expand of two numbers, x and y, okay? Which are going to be the x coordinate and the y coordinate. Because these are zero and ones, these are going to be exactly on the square counters. So if I take a picture for each picture I take of the Turing machine in motion, okay, I have a red point, which is exactly on the square counter set. When I take the next picture, this point is going to jump somewhere else. So it's the same to have the Turing machine working than to have a mapping between the square counter set, okay? And you can impose conditions on the map. There is a connection between qualities of this Turing machine and qualities of the mapping between the square counter sets. And uh, this was done, this was studied by, by Moore. And he observed that uh, if you want the Turing machine to be universal, so that it simulates any Turing machine, then you have some good properties of this uh, mapping between the square counter sets, uh, which are of this, of this type, okay? You have some specific way to move the squares in particular, the, the mapping, the restriction to each of the squares is a linear transformation and is area preserving. Uh, so there is, I mean, there is some proof to be done, but I want to convey now the next idea is that I have been talking about Turing machines. I have also been talking about dynamical system because it's obvious that the counter set, the way I showed the counter set is really a dynamical system. But if I think of a dynamical system, as the trajectory of a vector field, then uh, there is there are several ways, I'm not going to get very technical, to associate a Turing machine to, to the trajectory of a, of, a, of a vector field. But there is one which is the optimal one, which is the one which is to say a vector field is Turing complete if just by the trajectories of this vector field, it can simulate the computations of any Turing. I'm oh, sorry, I have a question. Uh, does it have to be two dimensional? Sorry, this is two dimensional so far. What, what? Yes, but is there a way to match it with a 3D vector? Yeah, I'm going to get there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I'm explaining this, this construction of Moore is two dimensional, thanks for the question. And I'm going to go to the 3D. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to go up to dimension three. That's going to be enough. So for me, it's going to be very important now that to understand the 2D situation. And the summary is that I'm going to be considering mappings between the square counter sets. And this is the same as a Turing machine. And this is what I want you to retain in 2D. And then I have to go to 3D. And I don't want to make a spoiler. I have to wait until we'll go to 3D. So, and indeed this definition applies to any dimension. Okay, we, we can always do this in any dimension. We have a, a dynamical system in any dimension, and we say it's Turing complete. If this definition depends on the choice of an open uh, set, but it's not so important. We can make it equivalent. Okay, uh, we say that this association between the Turing machine and the dynamical system is good if uh, the holding of a Turing machine. That, I, uh, that the Turing machine I'm associating is equivalent to the trajectories of the vector field entering a fixed open set. So now let's go back to the DAX. Imagine that this open set is a neighborhood of uh, Scotland. Okay? So it's equivalent that the, 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 the DAC arrives in Scotland, it's equivalent that the machine stops. Okay? If I can do such an association, then it tells you that the fact that the DAC or the trajectory of your particle enters that open set is undecidable because the holding problem is undecidable. That's the kind of game I'm going to play. So uh, now I want to look at some specific type of dynamical systems. And for that, I need to look at PDEs. I'm going to consider uh, incompressible fluids. So I could choose for incompressible fluids if I want to become rich or not. This depends if, my, if, my, if I have viscosity or not. 
if my system doesn't have viscosity, then the equations that govern uh, the movement of the fluids are the Euler equations. And if the system has viscosity, then I'm working with the Navier-Stokes, therefore I'm famous. But I decide to work with the Euler equations because I'm not famous. So I consider the equations that model uh, incompressible fluids with uh, no density. Okay. And these are the standard equations written in the language to explain to our students. Divergence, so I have a vector field x. x is, let me explain, x is the velocity of the fluid, p is the pressure, okay? And there is a constant evolution also in time, and everything depends on everything. So the pressure uh, affects the velocity of the fluid, and the velocity of the fluid affects the pressure, okay? And then I can look at these equations in the classical way, or I can decide to be very modern and put a Riemannian structure there. This is not very, this is not a crazy idea because if I consider R3 with the Euclidean metric, indeed I can write these equations exactly in terms of, of the connection associated to the Riemannian structure, the levitz vita connection, okay? So these equations are exactly the same as these equations here where the divergence also makes a, a sense for any Riemannian structure. And instead of using this old fashioned notation, I can use the covariant derivative okay, of, the, of the connection. This is a matter of language. I can decide to do this and then to, you know, to go a little bit uh, further allows me to have a more general view because I, I allow to change the, the metric. So what happens if the metric is not the Euclidean one? Then, okay, should we call these other equations? We decide that we call these Euler, Euler equations too. But then are these Euler equations physical? The answer is no, because the metric is, well, not physical in the sense it's not the Euclidean metric. But we can do things, and that's going to be an important point of what I'm going to explain next, that I allow to change the metric. That's very powerful for me. So because I'm a geometer, she didn't tell you, but I'm a geometer. I get very scared of having uh, PDs, right? So what do I do? I put myself in the simplest possible case. Is that what is the simplest possible case? The steady solutions. The steady solution. So the simple possible case is you don't know how to solve this. Assume that you don't have dependence on time, okay? So I'm going to follow what Isaac says. It's like we have been practicing yesterday night. It's not good. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Everyone that I know here, like the name I know here will get a similar question. So be scared. Okay. No, it's a joke. <laughs> okay. So uh, so then I look at the at the Euler's equation, as Isaac told me, in the possible case, in the, in the easiest case, which is a steady case, which is the case in which I don't have dependence on time. Then these equations uh, look as, as such. Okay, I have divergence equal to zero, novel x, x. Still, you know, I'm I really like the run homology. So what do I'm doing here? if I like the wrong cohomology. Okay, I'm going to convince you that you also like the wrong cohomology. What I do is the following. I take these equations up there and I'm going to change them a little bit in the following way. I'm going to contract a metric with uh, X, which is the solution to the Euler equation. And this gives me a one fourth. And I'm happy with one fourth. I feel very powerful. It's equivalent, it's the same, but uh, it makes me feel good. So indeed, uh, this is quite useful. If I take the metric, these equations read as some form being exact and some form being closed. What are these forms? Alpha is exactly, as I said here, the contraction of the metric with the, with the solution of the Euler equations, the velocity of the vector field, okay? And then uh, the, the differential of alpha, therefore, is a two form. When I contract with a vector field, I get a one form. Okay, so this one form, we say that this one form is exact if it's a differential of a function. So this is what this first equation tells me. Not only that, this is not any function, it's the Bernoulli function. And I can, the Bernoulli function depends on what? On the pressure and on the metric, again, because it depends, it's the pressure plus one half the norm according to the metric that you are using. 
And the second equation is some form being closed. This indeed, all this paraphernalia works in higher dimensions too, but I'm going to assume that in the, I'm in dimension three just for the sake of making things simpler. Uh, here, mu is a three form, it's a volume, okay? And the contraction of this volume with this uh, vector field is a two form. Okay, so this tells me that this, this is closed. Okay, so I'm happy with these equations. I, I can maybe ignore them, maybe they are useful yet later. I hope they are useful yet later because I spent two minutes explaining that. I wouldn't do this, right? Is that? Okay. So then I want to talk about particular type of stationary solutions, which are which have a name because they are famous, which are the Beltrami fields. Beltrami fields are fields that are proportional to their curve and which have divergence equal to zero. If the proportionality factor is constant, then I don't need to check that the divergence is zero. And as examples uh, of Beltrami fields, I have a type of examples which is very well known in KAM, which are the ABC flows for Arnold, uh, Childress, and B. Beltrami. Beltrami, of course. Arnold and Tommy Childhood's flows. These are uh, used in, uh, in KAM quite a lot. And I can think of them as vector fields on a three torus, and they have this expression. So these are examples of Beltrami fields, and also the hot fields, which are important because of the hot vibration. Okay. So these are Beltrami fields on the three sphere. So I have here examples of Beltrami fields on three manifolds, which are compact, the three sphere and the three torus. So, okay, time to talk about money. A million dollars for a correct answer. So let's look at, uh, we mathematicians, we had, to, we had to do something, right? We had to prove these conjectures. These were the millennium problems, what did we do? Only one of them has been solved, which is the Poincare conjecture, and the guy didn't get the money, right? That's why there is this Poincare chair in Paris because the money was used for the Poincare chair. Okay, so out of all these conjectures here, Let's talk about the Navier-Stokes equations, but just a little bit, and let's try to connect it to the question that Tao, yeah. Can I ask a question about the previous slide before This the, one, Perelman. The one before that, <laughs> not this one. <laughs> so yeah. with this Beltrami, the Beltrami fields, like, should I think of those as being like generic, like most things are Beltrami, or should I think of them That's... as like special type of vector? Yeah, but, but you are going very wild now, because what do you want, uh, that I fix the, the metric or I don't fix the metric? That's the either either one, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. So that's 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 in it. Because the other yeah, case is that has been studied by by Daniel Peralta Salas. And here I'm working on this because I have a friend whose name is Daniel Peralta Salas, who has been all his life working on the family fields. So he proved that they are generic. But I'm not going to, I'm not going to get into this. Okay, that's that's fine. That's but fine. I we can talk about this later. Um, I want to prove that Turing the Turing completeness is also a, a generic condition for them. <laughs> What is time? Is it just a coordinate on S? What is time? Isn't it a coordinate on M? Yeah, what is time? Time? In these are equations. Steady, like these are steady states. So steady. No... Ah, in the studies, there is no time because I don't have dependence on time. Oh, but what does time mean in the first place? Because X is on vector field on M. Right? Yeah, but then you have this vector field. Okay, that's a good question. Then this vector field, you can take the flow. Oh, okay. And then you have time. But it's not the same time as the dependence of the PD. You can think, let's say, that's a very good question. Let's say the PD gives me a raise to another E, okay, which is this one. And this other E, you can consider the flow, of course. Okay. Uh, okay, let's talk about Navier Stokes. We said we are adding here this perturbation that we didn't have on the former equation, which becomes depends on the viscosity. Okay. And then, well, in a neutral, what is the problem of the quick formulation of the problem is that it's not known whether you have some initial conditions and whether long term these, these solutions blow up or not. Okay. And this has a, this has even a physical explanation. If you want a precise uh, condition because you want to earn this $1 million, you go to the webpage of the Clive Foundation and you find the description done by Pfefferman, which I'm snapshotting here, okay? From the web page, you have these equations, you have some initial conditions. And the thing is that, of course, if you start, the first day you, the first day you start thinking about this, you can find some crazy initial conditions that make the conditions blow up. So 
just in case there are some bounds uh, on the initial condition. So not any initial condition uh, will work. You have uh, some, some constraints, okay? And essentially to prove or disprove the Navier Stokes uh, in the description by Pfefferman, you have what he calls the symmetric case and then the standard case or the case on R3 on the three torques. So in, essentially, you want to prove one of the situations, the existence of the smoothness of the Navier-Stokes solutions or break down what is called blow up of the Navier-Stokes solutions, okay? And in dimension two, uh, Olga Leidy already in, in 1958, she proved that, the, the, that there is no blow up. What happens with the three-dimensional case? This has been like, uh, this has been on the news uh, recently, there are people trying to prove that there is blow up with uh, machine learning or with the stability conditions, et cetera. In, in 2016, maybe, I mean, I don't know who put the light on, but maybe you can let the people sleep in peace. I don't know if I will write again on the, on the board. Uh, maybe, well, I don't know. It's okay. So in 2016, uh, in his paper in Hams, in one of his papers in Hams, Tao wrote the following idea. He proved indeed the the, the blow up of some kind of equations that he called the average Navier Stokes equations. And in the, in the introduction to the paper, he pointed to the following idea. This is a snapshot from the paper. One could hope to design logic gates entirely out of an ideal fluid. If these gates were sufficiently Turing complete and also noise tolerant, noise tolerant means that if you have something that is Turing complete and you perturb, you still get a Turing complete thing. That's what Taos was asking. One could hope to combine all these gates together to program a self-replicating von Neumann machine. What that he mean? He meant the following, he wanted to find some initial conditions to the navier stokes and he was pointing indeed to the Euler equations in his paper, such that they were Turing complete, okay? And this was in 2016. At this moment, I didn't care about these equations. I was doing something else. But then in 2019, I was looking at Twitter and again, this, que this question was resurrected somehow. And at that moment, I was with my student, Robert Cardona, and I gave him, we were working on some problem where we had some contact structures. And then at that moment, I knew that contact structures, prefer camera, camera is disconnected again, okay? Contact the structure in the, in the, in the very precise moment was like you could form it onto the solution to the stuff. <laughs> That's very clear. Okay, so uh, at that moment, uh, we were working in some interesting connection between contact geometry and Beltramic fields. And this is what I'm going to explain. And then at that moment, I, I told Robert, okay, let's try to answer this question by Taos that you are crazy. And that's what we tried to do. And this is what I'm going to explain. What we did was to construct a uh, solution to the Euler equation of a Trami field that is Turing complete. Okay, that's what we learned. And how we did this? We did this using contact geometry. Okay, so I need to explain the connection of this problem that so far has been PDEs, ODEs, Turing machines, and dynamical systems. Now we have a new guest in the room, which is contact geometry, okay? So, and we constructed what we call the fluid computer. Of course, we didn't call the fluid computer. We wrote a paper and we said, other equations, uh, Turing complete, other. And then we were interviewed, I don't know, one day somebody calls in your door and he says, I'm from El Pais. This was the most important national, and I want to make you an interview. So he asked me, what did you prove? I explained him all the details, three hours. The guy didn't die, but he was there listening to me very carefully. And at the end of the conversation, he, he tells me, okay, explain me a way to understand this. And then I remember this advertisement of Sea Toledo, which is this car and the poor rubber ducks. And I explained him the rubber ducks. And then what we could read on the newspaper the day after. Four mathematicians understand why 29,000 rubber ducks were roasting the ocean. Mm -hmm. Um, and my father says he studied all this to, to, to know that when you throw these ducks to the sea, they will never appear again. 
Okay, but also besides this title and in, in the in the story, he was calling fluid computer. He said they were able to construct a fluid computer. And I said, really, where's the fluid computer? I don't know, but then I called it, I decided to put fluid computer. So what we have is an abstract design of this fluid computer. We don't have really a room where you can see the fluid computer. <laughs> Which would be cool, right? And why don't we have this? Because the answer is we cannot construct it because the metric is not the Euclidean one in our construction. It's the Euclidean one almost everywhere. But in a tiny space, this metric changes in a violent and drastic way. So I cannot really construct, I can only approximate. But that approximation is not good for twin completeness. So I will explain this. So <clears throat> the story of the of the rubber ducks. Okay. So this is something we did in December 2020. We proved that there exist these stationary Euler flows in dimension three, which are Turing complaints. So what we did was Tao was asking, give me an Euler uh, flow that is Turing complete. And what we did, we say, okay, sir, we give you uh, um, uh, something that is Turing complete, but it's going to be a stationary solution. Maybe you don't like it. So then we did some other solutions which are not the stationary one, but in dimension three, we managed to make it in for the for time if it's. And this is where now I'm going to need all these constructions. We were 2D and your question is totally irrelevant now because these constructions were two dimensional and now I want to produce a three dimensional thing, okay? So the, the idea is the following. I want to take the construction by Chris Moore and I want to look at this construction as some kind of Poincaré section of my 3D construction. So I want to think of a vector field whose time one map is exactly the map by Moore. That's the idea. There is some work to be done because, okay, the one by Moore is a construction which leaves, uh, which is full of holes because this is on the, it's a mapping between two square counter sets. So first thing I need to do is to extend the construction of Moore to a disk. Yeah. Easy. So first we, we extend the construction of Moore to a disk and then the problem is we need to find a vector field whose time one map is exactly this one. And this one has to have some good properties because this disk, we will extend it to the big manifold. So we need it to be close to the identity in a neighborhood and we need it to be area preserving. So this is my shopping list. I need an area preserving the homomorphism. How are you going to do it? Contact geometry, somebody here knows, a couple of people here know that the solution comes from contact geometry. Well, now also it's up. Okay. So what we need is, we need that this vector field, we need to have a special geometry, which is that of red vector field, okay? So first thing is that I want to clarify what is the connection to other equations and to now the stokes of this thing. So now I have to become a little geometrical. There are two geometries, when I was explaining before the, uh, the Euler equations, I was really wanting to have uh, forms in my in my definition, I said, oh, because I like forms, blah, blah, blah. So indeed, these are geometry associated to forms. And I don't need today maybe symplectic geometry, though the ideas come from symplectic geometry. I concentrate and focus on contact geometry. I, need, I don't need all these, but I wanted to show you my camel. I just need contact manifolds, which are three-dimensional. So I just need 3D contact manifolds. And these are given by a one form, alpha, that has some interesting condition, which is this condition here, different from zero. So what I want, alpha is a one form, the alpha is a two form, alpha which the alpha is a three form, we're in business, we're in three dimensions. So I want this three form to be in this, a volume form of my manifold. That's the only condition. And this condition looks natural. What does it mean? Particularly, the differential of alpha cannot be zero. So this is completely the opposite to integrability. So if I look at the kernel of alpha, okay, then the kernel of alpha cannot come from an integrable distribution. You have a nice picture of Robert Grice that captures this. Yes, show me. Okay, that's a nice picture by Robert Grice. These uh, planes here are the kernel of alpha, where alpha is, 
this alpha here. This is a one form on R3 that it's an example. And it's more than any example, it's the example. We can always find local coordinates such that alpha looks like this. Okay, so when we, when we look at the kernel of alpha, these planes are going to go all around over the plane. So I cannot find a surface such that at each point, okay, the tangent space of this surface generates the kernel of alpha. So it's the opposite to integral B, okay? So it's totally equivalent to say that alpha with the alpha is a volume form, that the kernel of alpha is not integral. And that's the, the standard example in contact geometry. Okay, why is contact geometry also useful? To car a car. To, if you want to park your car, you need contact geometry. Well, I don't know, maybe. So we know that it's so easy as uh, you go a little bit, uh, you advance and then you go back and then you want to parallel transport in parallel and you, you park your, so it's just four steps. How can you do this? Well, Emmy Murphy tell us that you can always, if you have a car of length L, you can always parallel park it in a space of length L plus epsilon. And remember epsilon is the strictly positive number, okay? So what happens when epsilon goes to zero? You know what happens. But okay, here we have the contact structure is given in terms of the angle of the of the parking up. So it's a, it's so you can use okay contact geometry makes you a better citizen. In particular, you can park your car better. Okay. But now let's be back in business. And why contact geometry? What is the connection of contact geometry and Beltrami fields? Let's start with an example. Let's take the examples of Beltrami fields that I described before. We had we had Isaac, what did we have? Do you remember? The There's examples. The ABC flow. The ABC flow. Yeah, and the other example? The hot field. The hot field. Let's take the hot field. It's better. Okay, if I take the hot field, oh, look, here I have already computed it. It's fantastic. There is a one form such that the red vector field is precisely the hot field. Oh, maybe any Beltrami field is a red vector field. Then maybe I can try to. Uh, solve problems with fluids using contact geometry. Aha, indeed, indeed, there are the hot coordinates that show you that something is Beltrami very easily if you didn't realize that it's the same. Okay, so indeed, let's ask the experts, Arnold and Suleiman. It was Suleiman, the first one who suggested that this alpha had to be a contact form, but this was indeed proved by Anna and Greist. What they did is to prove that there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between Beltrami fields and red vector fields up to reparametrization. So maybe you don't have exactly the same vector field, but you have a multiple. And then you can reparametrize just to have the same vector field, okay? And how did they check it? Because they had the equations with forms, okay? We have the equations of the, the Euler equation. These were the... Beltrami, the solutions of the stationary solutions written in the language of forms, okay? And then this is, this, these forms, these expressions here, you can use them to check exactly that alpha is a contact form. This is very easy. The most difficult thing is the other implication. That's what they did. So we can use what they prove. We can use it in many different ways. Okay, that's the theorem they prove. A non-vanishing Beltrami field, with positive proportionality factor. So the proportionality factor is the F such that the vector field is proportional to the curve, okay? And uh, so any non-vanishing Beltrami fields are a parametrization of a red flow, and conversely, any parametrization of a red vector field is a non-vanishing Beltrami field. Good. Oh yeah, by the way, why did I choose this, this picture? Because while well, this is indeed a picture, this is a real picture, this is not mid-journey. Looks like it's mid journey, but this is from the from this lake that is very close to to the Banff, to Pierce in Banff, which is Lake Louis. Okay, so you have a perfect reflection of the sky on the water. So this is the perfect metaphor of the of the connection between fluids and contact geometry. And you can do many things with this. This is what we have been doing at that moment. Poor Robert Cardona was my student, so he was everywhere doing all this, but. You can find several applications of this because you can, for instance, compare the dynamics 
of the reactor fields for which you know many things to the atomic fields, essentially. But today we are just going to do one thing because time is getting over. Oh my God, half 10 minutes. You, you haven't, we started a little late. Oh, okay, thank you. Okay, so let's see what I can do. Okay, I'm, I'm going to focus on this construction here because he asked, can we go to 3D? I'm going to use a kind of trick of rep suspension of an area preserving diffeomorphism of the disk. This will take me from 2D to 3D. Okay, I'm going to do this. So uh, Moore is two dimensional. Okay, here is a picture of Moore. Here is the red dot jumping from the square counter set to the square counter set. So now I want to, to do a, uh, I want to look at this as the Poincare snatch. Okay, how do you do this? You write down and you find a contact form such that the red vector field is exactly has this, this time one map. It's very easy. Okay, so that's what we did. And what does this produce for you? Well, this produces for you a red vector field inside this, uh, this uh, dense torus, but you have to extend it away. And you can do it because uh, one of the things of contact geometry is that it's very easy to deform. And you, you can extend it to, to an arbitrary uh, three-dimensional manifold. So this construction, I'm describing it on this uh, neighborhood, but you can extend it. Okay, so this construction gives you a red vector field. So I just use the magic mirror. And by using the magic mirror, I get a Beltrami field. Okay. And okay, what is this Beltrami field? Well, this Beltrami field is, is a solution of the Euler equation. So the only thing I need to check is that this guy here has the properties of Turing completeness. But it's easy. I started with a Turing complete thing. I do a Taiwan map, it's easy. Then I go to Tao, we wrote him an email. We have solved your question. He said, oh, cute. But you didn't do it independent. Always oh, satisfied. Then we had to do it independent, but we had to do it in higher energies. This is something that I will not explain today because time is over. Uh, so what we prove is exactly this. There exists an ailerizable uh, flow, indeed given by a Beltrami field on a three sphere or any compact manifold. Not necessarily three sphere, it doesn't matter. Okay, and the metric, the metric can be assumed to be the Euclidean, the Euclidean one outside this uh, disk. Why not inside the disk? Because inside the disk, I'm dramatically using the connection between red vector fields and Beltrami fields. And for that, okay, the, the way to make things uh, match. I need to deform the contact structure. In this mirror, yeah, I'm going to write a little bit. So in our mirrors, when here you deform the contact structure, this on the other side of the mirror, you are deforming the metric. So that's why you don't have a, a control of the metric. That's why I cannot construct for you this fluid computer, okay, and do a pattern and become millionaire. It's impossible. Okay, so that's what we did. And as a consequence, because the whole thing problem is undecidable, and this uh, way to associate the dynamical system to the Turing machine is such that entering an open set is equivalent to the point holding, there are paths that are undecidable. So there exists undecidable fluid particle paths. That's a consequence of the construction that is quite surprising because it's, a, it's not standard chaos, it's different kind of chaos. And okay, does this give you $1 million? The answer is no. Indeed, we could plug the Beltrami field, we could use the properties of Beltrami field, put them, short answer is no, and long answer, read the paper, read my paper, which is okay, we, you have here the Navier Stokes, you plug things, and then you get an expression here, which first, uh, we were not able to associate a Turing machine to the Navier stops. And this is something that is still pending because this can only uh, reproduce a finite number of steps. And secondly, it doesn't blow up. So it's like completely, it's a no no. But okay, the question is okay, you didn't get the blow, this blow up, but can you try other constructions? as Tao was suggesting that if something is noise tolerant and Turing complete and something by perturbation, you start with something Turing complete, 
another flow, and somehow you think of the navier stokes like a perturbation. This is uh, this is this would be nice, but it's not possible. Why? Because some people in computer science, Oliver Burnes, Daniel Grassa, and Emmanuel Henry, already proved that it's not possible to construct Turing complete systems with finite energy, which are robot, robust by perturbation. So adding viscosity to the problem makes us lose the computational pro, uh, power. So the answer is still don't know how to associate the Turing machine to an Navier Stokes system. We cannot do it, as Tau suggested. Uh, starting with the with the Euler flow, because from because the perturbation kills the, the the computational power. So can we do this better? Indeed, well, I don't know what it better means, but we were able to. Uh, one thing we did was to to fix the the, the metric, and then the methods are non-geometrical. So we constructed a Turing complete. Uh, Beltrami field in R3 with a Euclidean metric. The problem is that energy goes to infinity. So it was not very realistic. Not something we did. We also did a T dependent construction, but I'm going to skip it because, uh, okay, which is what's outside the Beltrami box. And it's because we get, we get a construction, not in dimension three, but in a, in a horrible higher dimensional thing. But I want to discuss new ideas. The first one is because we have a very good connection between um, between uh, red dynamics and Beltrami fields, can we find some Turing complete system on the on on, for instance, on the three body problem, etc.? We are working on these kind of things because this would be very interesting, but we still don't know how to do it. This is done by mid journey, and the other thing I wanted to discuss, but I'm going to finish here. So it's going to still remain a mystery, is the hybrid computer. So now we have the fluid computer, which means this, this tube here, okay? We can think of this like uh, the construction I explained, which I can think it's inside a torus, okay? And I can put this torus like a cylinder. And now if I have a cylinder and I have been, you know, I have been doing geometry, what I want to do is play uh, topological pattern theory with these elements. So I take the fluid, indeed, as computational unit of a new machine. And then, so this is the new machine. This, this is not a very nice picture. I have tried one hour today with Midjourney, and I'm disappointed. But this is what Midjourney thinks is the hybrid computer between, between the fluid computer and quantum computer. I don't know, I need to train more. But okay, what we are doing now, this is a still working progress. And I, I have to say, this is not written here. I'm doing this with Angel Montalet Prieto. And Daniel Peralta Salas. So what we are doing now is, is to do topological quantum field theory with these pieces, which we call the fluids. But this is very nice to become crazy. And this is at the beginning. Angel and I started to work on uh, in my office. And at some point, Daniel enters and says, oh, this is very nice. But Eva, where is the theorem? Daniel, give me a moment. I mean, we'll find the theorem. So the theorem and the question was very appropriate coming from Daniel. Uh, the theorem is that you need to associate a computational model to this topological quantum field uh, template with the fluids. And the computational mo model, and we have understood, needs to be one that allows you to concatenate, to glue things. Okay? So the, the computational model so that you need is that of partial recursive functions that allow to make compositions of this guy. So indeed, what is this hybrid computer? This hybrid computer is just a functor from the category of cobordis, where we need to also decorate with a transverse vector field, like in this case would be the red vector field. So indeed, this model would be a generalization of everything we have done before. And this takes us to, the, to what Angel called, I think it's a very cute name, 
computational field theory, which is the category uh, of possible computations that you can do with this. So the, the one that go, works well for us is that of partial recursive functions. Partial means that the function doesn't need to be defined everywhere. And this comes, indeed, the, the idea comes from the fact that in the square Cantor set, that's an example of partial uh, function. And recursive because we need to be able to glue things. And for instance, the pans in topological quantum field theory will be the all in our computation. So we're still working on that, but what's clear is that by definition, the computations are done at time one because we are doing the computations just by taking a vector field and looking at time one. So this is quicker than quantum computer, but we cannot construct it. But how many quantum computers did you see constructed? Not so much. Okay, and I think that's that's the end of my talk. Thanks for your attention. Questions and comments. Stop it. Um, two questions. So first, um, what what class does your solution belong to? What class? Yeah. Sin yeah. So our our construction is infinity. The regularity is, is infinity. Okay. Um, so yeah. Uh, so. One option, are you going to ask me about the, the construction of LGD and uh, changing the regularity? No, I was going to ask about stability. What's that? S stability of the solution. Ah, that's, that's a very good question. That's a very good question. Because indeed, the construction, I mean, even what are the, what is the entropy of the, I mean, how, how is dynamically your solution? Even as, before stability, what is the entropy of, of your Turing machine? And and indeed, you, we, we think, you've, at the beginning, we thought that something that was Turing complete had to have positive entropy. This one, that the one I explained, has positive entropy. We still, uh, this is a short paper. We, we have to post an archive. It's still not an archive. Because whenever you can, uh, because this construction comes from this uh, generalized shift. And if the generalized shift has some combinatorics, uh, then you can see that the entropy is, is positive. Uh, but we have examples of Turing complete. Indeed, the other, the other construction that I didn't explain, the one that is analytical. Now I don't know what I did with that. Okay, I'm past. I don't know what I I don't know what I did with my well, let me pass my ah here. The this construction here, the Beltrami field that, that has the Euclidean metric, this one uh, has uh, two dimensional restrictions with have zero entropy because the construction of this machine is a cylinder over a two dimensional construction, and the two dimensional construction is a cylinder over, over a, a Turing complete system on, a, on an interval. We used a construction by some people in Paris. So, in particular, it has invariant two-dimensional dynamics and, and on, on a two-sphere. And, and by definition, the entropy is going to be zero of that. So it's still the restriction is Turing complete. So we have examples of Turing complete systems with zero entropy. This is surprising. So it's not clear what is the relation between the, it's not clear what is the relation between the, the dynamical uh, complexity and the computational complexity. And again, now coming back to your question, what about the stability? The, the question is the same, okay? Uh, the dynamical, uh, the one that we construct has a lot of horseshoes. So I have a lot of periodic orbits. I have a lot of hyperbolic dynamics there. So for, for the construction that I explained you, it's easy to study stability. But in general, if I want to understand the general case, which is the interesting one, because this is just an example, and this example is not good enough, for instance, to give me any, any blow up. So uh, to understand the general case, to understand if a general construction of a Turing complete system associated to an average Stokes, which we still don't have, uh, and to understand the relation between the stability, which is one of the pathways to the counterexample of the average Stokes, but the people in, in Caltech, this, this would be very interesting, but we don't know. I mean, it seems that it seems that you can have many different behaviors. Thank you for the question. Um, 
I think you mentioned at once that you can do something different in different in high dimensions. Uh, yes, in higher dimensions, I can do things that uh, I'm scared to explain you because first time I explained this, I was very, you know, when I started to work on this, it was in 2019. And then I was very, I was very excited because I was using the H principle in contact geometry. And as everyone who uses the H principle, you, 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 you feel you have superpowers, okay? But it's not true. Then you go and give your talk, Zurich, in the analysis group. I don't know why I gave the talk in the analysis group. But I was overexcited and I was saying, oh, look, yeah, I got this construction. I was proving that any dynamical system, I can embed it as a solution of the Euler equation, but in higher dimensions. And for that, I was using the H principle. And the dimension of the space was, at that moment, it was 5n plus 7. Then it became, I was able to make it better, but it's 3n plus something. So I was overexcited, and then somebody told me, what about dimension 3? And then I thought, ah. <laughs> so now I'm, what I'm going to explain is more or less the same. Like, uh, this is the picture. Like, what outside the Bertrand box? Can you do a construction that is time dependent? Now we don't want stationary solutions, but I want a truly complete uh, solution of the order equation, which is time independent. Okay, I want this because I want to test the Navier stokes. The, the problem is that the construction with it uh, really uses an embedding on a manifold. I, I, you know, I mean, like, don't throw tomatoes at me. I mean, it's that's a manifold. Okay, the dimension of the manifold is 10 to the 35. <laughs> Okay, I will never give a talk in Zurich explaining this because I know the result. Okay, yeah, I, I remember this was November 2019. So the, we, I have a construction, but then I need to go of an Euler, but then I need to go to this dimension. And then the, the question is, uh, most of the things I explain now in dimension three work in higher dimensions, but then of course, the Euler and Navier Stokes were interested in dimension three. So for the time dependent, we, we really need to go to higher dimensions. And some other people who are working on this, they really need to go to higher dimensions. Thank you. Julie? Oh, I, I can ask after, I don't know. I guess uh, I had a question to clarify the Tao's original question. So was Tao asking about the dynamics of the Euler, the time dependent Euler equations like as a flow on the space of vector fields, or was he asking? Ah, uh, no, 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 that, that's a very good question, what you are saying. Indeed, he was asking what it's in this slide. Indeed, if you go, if, if you look at the time-dependent case, indeed, what you are asking is in this slide. It's a coincidence. Out of my 58 slides, I confess I had 58 slides. That's a lot. But uh, indeed, uh, when, you, when you look at the Turing completeness, the one I have been using, the, the, the notion of Turing completeness, I have been using today in this talk for the stationary case, uses the dynamics of the vector field. The initial question of tau, indeed, if we want to do it for the time dependent, we need to consider the set of volume preserving vector fields and the dynamics in this, in this space. Sure. I don't know if that was the question. That was my question. So that's so that his so his thing was really just taking. Like if you can kind of find of kind kind of find self-replicating initial conditions or yes. something like that. That's the, yes. and that would be the thing that produces the answer. But the dynamic. But but, uh, but I think that but I, I I from what I have understood now from people in computer science because this Turing completeness you need also people in computer science because of this result of these uh, guys. The guys in the cube. Mm -hmm. I know where where is it? Uh, this is before. Uh, yeah. These guys here, Burnef, uh, Grasa, and Heinrich, they prove that if you have a Turing complete system and you perturb it, it's not going to be Turing complete anymore. So the, this, in a way, it doesn't tell you that tau is wrong, but it tells you that most probably if you plug some initial conditions that are Turing complete in your system and you make the system evolve, it's going to stop being Turing complete. Mm. That's what it's pointing uh, to. I mean, I realized about this, we realized about this later on when you start working on this, you don't know anything. But uh, so in a way you have to be able to find it, but in a different way, it's, uh, I don't know.
then let's thank Eva for a very interesting program.